My name is Krista Ovenel, and I have a small company called Death's Apprentice. You can find me at deathsapprentice.ca on the World Wide Web, also known as the Information Superhighway, if you are a lady of a certain age, such as myself. Um, I am here to talk to you about a pretty serious topic. It's what happens when you die. So we're not going to go where you might think we're going to go with this. And, uh, and I've got a presentation put aside for you that takes a really practical look at that exact topic. Um, I want to invite you at any time. Uh, we do actually have a moderator. I'm in this awkward position where I can't quite see everything that's going on. So if there are questions, please put them in the chat and hopefully I'll be interrupted so that I can address them. But you can also wait until the end. I am not going to drag you through a 90 minute ordeal here. Um, I think that we'll be able to get through relatively quickly. And if there are any, if there are any questions, we can go to that at the end, but please feel warmly welcome to, to just come at any point, okay? So I would just like to begin with a couple of acknowledgements, actually. The first and very important one is that I'm here in a um, country known as Canada, and um, we are a settler nation. And so I would like to just acknowledge that I'm coming to you here from a beautiful part of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And this is the traditional and unceded territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam and the Squamish peoples. This is simply objective fact. The other acknowledgement that I'd like to make is that I am just blown away by what Joe and Victoria have created here this weekend and the, the relentless dedication that they have put together. Um, I, am, I am so impressed with what they've done and, and what they're doing and the conversations that they're enabling this weekend. And I, I truly believe well into the future. So thank you. So I have a couple of disclaimers and, and here's, here's one of them. I call myself Death's Apprentice for a reason. I'm not one of these people who's been doing this for 35 years. I'm not that guy in the ugly suit trying to sell you a very expensive casket. Um, my father didn't do this for a living. I am a funeral director, an embalmer. I am an end of life doula. Um, I have a couple of certifications. My first career was in hospitality and my second was in education. Um, when I was 18, and I am not 18 anymore, um, I, I did my first apprenticeship as a chef, actually. And then many years later, about 30 years later, I left a really wonderful um, world of education um, to do this. And I stepped back into an apprenticeship, which was really hard in my late 40s. I have now come to terms with that. And I realize that the beginner mindset is actually something that um, brings an incredible vision to this and frankly, all topics. So I'm not the expert. I might not even be able to answer questions that you have in this session, but if I can't, I will hunt the answers down for you and I will ensure that you, that you get what you need out of this, okay? Another disclaimer coming your way. I am going to ask you to do these things with me. And this is what I do with all of my clients. I ask them to be brave, to be honest, and really the very most important thing is to be ready for something with a hundred percent certainty of happening literally in your lifetime. Um, we are shockingly ill-prepared to deal with death. We are shockingly ill-prepared to deal with the practical tasks and chores associated with death. And we are incredibly unready to deal with the emotions and the messy bits, the difficult bits. So I get that this is hard work. I get that this is something that we have to kind of suit up for. Um, and it requires a kind of relentless honesty. But if you can do that, and I'm going to do that, it's why I start with the fact that 
I'm actually fairly new to this world. I'm going to be honest with you. Please be honest with yourselves. And together, we can be ready. So I'm here in Canada. I covered that right at the beginning. Um, and uh, I've heard this saying a few times, I'm a mortician, not a magician. And usually it's used around body care. But um, the simple fact is, is that I, I can't um, kind of fix everything. And, and what the whole point of this next little bit of time that we're going to spend together is, is for you to be kind of forewarned, um, to have a, a larger sense than you might currently have of what happens when you die. Your mileage, as they say, it may vary because you might be here with me in BC, the Cheryl is, but other folks probably might, might not be. Um, so even if you're in a different province here in Canada, but certainly if you're in a different country, uh, the actual nuts and bolts of what I'm talking about, the, some of the details may differ. However, what won't differ is a general overall content, okay? So, um, and again, if questions come up that are, are detail specific to areas of the, of the world that I'm not in, I can totally help you find the answer. Okay. So, you know, I've already told you how much I love Joe and Victoria. Um, and I sure hope they bring me back next year. I want you to really understand that I am coming from the perspective of a funeral director and someone who, an expert, if you will, who is going to come in and assist from the outside. Death care can all be done, all of it, by you yourself with no license and, um, and no two years of schooling and no wicked apprenticeship. You can actually care for your own dead in your own home. And those are all options. When I said no license, you actually will need a couple of licenses. You'll need licenses to transport. You'll need licenses for disposition, that kind of thing. But that's not what we're going to, that's not how we're going to frame this. So next year, I'm really hoping that we can talk about community death care and caring for your own dead. But right now, what we're going to talk about is if you're inviting someone to help you mediate the experience, a funeral director to kind of help. Okay. All right. This is it. This is, this is what happens when you die. We are not going to be talking about the spiritual elements. I understand there's a good number of witches and psychopomps at this event. So chat with them. But for me, the pathologically practical, we're going to stick to the realities of the tasks and chores and the kinds of things that will be thrown at you when a death occurs. And I am passionate about this. I am often surprised because I'm both a funeral director and an end of life doula. I, I cross in a lot of um, in, the, in a lot of paths, you know. And I am often surprised by how even end of life doulas, how even social workers in hospitals, how even palliative nurses might not actually know the nitty gritty details of what happens when a death occurs because none of it is their job their job stopped the second you stopped breathing and that's actually when my job started so um i've been a guest lecturer in a in a course here in vancouver uh, that's at one of the big colleges about end-of-life doula work and I'm, I'm the the guest lecturer as a funeral director um, and in every class that I've that I've participated in, there's been folks who are really intimately connected to the, the healthcare industry, for example, and often this is news to them. Um, I, I truly know some nurses, for example, who don't actually know where the morgue is in their hospital. So you need to know this and we don't talk about it. And the reason you need to know it is because um, things unravel very quickly and you will be expected to make decisions very quickly. And without having a knowledge base to draw on, you may make decisions that you regret later. So we're going to talk about these, these three areas, the expected versus unexpected death, the hospital death, and then the home death, hospice death, death in a care facility, or uh, death in community.
And at some point you'll probably meet at least one of my cats because that's what it's like these days. So I'd like to start with an expected hospital death, um, largely because frankly, that's where we die these days. That wasn't always true. We didn't used to die in hospitals. And in fact, we they basically used to die at home. And it's only been a little over a hundred years that this shift has happened. What's very interesting is that a lot of people, when they do allow them to th themselves to think about death, um, imagine and hope for a death that occurs in a home, in their home. But the reality is most deaths nowadays do happen in a hospital. And many deaths that occur in a hospital are expected. The vast majority of deaths in a hospital would be considered expected. Um, I actually, when I'm when I'm being super ranty, I have a I have some thoughts on um, the whole concept of an unexpected death, but I do get it. Uh, a death that that occurs um, without warning actually is very unexpected. So we're going to start with expected hospital deaths. All right, and I think the key with the expected hop hospital death is that hospitals have morgues, virtually every hospital in the world this is one geographic truth that i can that i can stand on here hospitals have morgues morgues are places to put body so in hospital death in expected hospital death you can take your time and the reason you can take your time is because hospitals have morgues so there is somewhere to take your dead person so when death occurs, it is really important. You you might need an advocate for to, to navigate this, what's about to happen when a death occurs, because even though you can be present and you can take your time, you might not be aware that you can do that. A nurse might hand you a form that says along the lines of which funeral home would you like us to call? Your person might get wheeled away with a um, wheeled away with a porter and taken down a hallway, and that could be the last time you see your person. So remember, and remember that you might need an advocate, and it is okay to have an advocate, just like you might in a birth setting, just like you might for any other event that you have to deal with in a hospital it's okay to have an advocate. And an advocate might look like an end-of-life doula. It might look like a friend. It might look like a, a, a really talented social worker or a nurse that you've connected with. Um, it could be your partner. And, and it, could be, it, could be really, it could be really anyone that is there to help you um, as you deal with the person who is, who is dying. Help understand the questions that are being asked and someone who can help remind you that you can take your time. So when, an, when, a, when a death occurs in a hospital setting, you might be surprised to know that um, most of the time, a nurse will not, or a hospital worker, doesn't come in and respectfully close the dead person's eyes and pull a sheet up over their face. Usually what will happen is the body will simply be wheeled away and it will probably be wheeled away when you're not looking. So remember to ask for the time that you need. Um, during COVID, it was very, very difficult when we couldn't be together with people in end of life settings. Um, but most, most places that has changed and we can now have people around us again. When you are going into a hospital, when you're taking someone that you love into a hospital, um, it is important to have your advanced care planning work done, to have their advanced care planning work done. And it's important to say what you would like to happen if the death occurs when you are not present, because that body doesn't have to go anywhere. All right. In an expected home hospital death setting, um, there it, it, the paperwork, which I'll get into a little later, because the paperwork is quite generic, is very um, is very straightforward, which is part of why we find ourselves in a bit of a rush situation sometimes. As a general rule, unless in the case of infant deaths, you can take um, you can be expected to easily take about three hours with your dead person. 
And during that time, you can bring any kind of service or ceremony to that person, or you can just sit quietly. Again, your advocate might, might help you with that. You can ask for water to, to ceremonially, ceremonially bathe, you can anoint, you can do really anything with your person. And if they're hooked up to tubes and things like that, um, you can also ask for them to be removed. All right. So when your person goes away to the hospital morgue, your person will stay there in that very safe, very clean, very um, sterile environment until you talk to the funeral home that you're going to use. And again, remember, I'm framing this all around the idea that you will be using the experience, the, the experience of somebody like me in a, in a funeral home. So you have time at that level too, because your person will go from a room temperature room to a refrigerated setting, and you can actually take a little bit of time before you make any other decisions, all right? So I'm going to just briefly touch on the unexpected hospital death, okay? These do happen. They're not very common, but they do happen. Let's say you went in for knee surgery and you died. That would be what would be considered an unexpected hospital death. Nothing is different in everything that I just said, with the exception of this will now be what's called a coroner reportable death, a coroner reportable death. And that means that there is a, a slightly different set of paperwork and there's some stuff that happens behind the scenes that, that you might not ever be informed about. Um, and that is really the only difference. When you are going in for any kind of work to be done in a hospital, you should have your advanced care planning paperwork in order. I can help with that, as a matter of fact. Um, but uh, but it is important to ensure that, and again, you may need an advocate, that if an unexpected hospital death occurs, you ask for the time that you need and you take time, you spend time with your person. You might need to be vociferous on this. And that's again, where advocates can come in handy. When an unexpected hospital death occurs, Everything is the same on the surface, but there is some, some stuff that becomes a little different behind the scenes, including if there is any sort of investigation that needs to be done, you could find yourself in a situation where you're not able to see your person again for quite some time. All right, the next that I'd like to go to is an expected home death. All right, um, there's, um, there's a lot to, to kind of say about expected home deaths and they are starting to become more common. And as our demographics shift in the future uh, and those boomers finally start dying, goodness, God bless the boomers, but they've changed everything that uh, they've ever touched and they're going to change this space too. So, an expected home death uh, is something that, that is becoming more and more common. And I think that it's really important to put it out there that things in an expected home death actually still might not be as expected. The labor of dying is difficult and caring for the dying can be difficult. So things might not go as you expect, and it's okay to ask for help. You can ask for help probably from, in, in Canada here, you can ask from your local health authorities um, and they probably have that wherever you are as well. You can also bring in people like end of life doulas or even just set up like help trains uh, with friends and things like that because it can, it can be quite difficult to care for someone who is dying at home. The other piece about things not happening as you expect them to happen is that you might think that you'll be able to be there all the time. You might think, you might have been told by a palliative worker, for example, that you've got a week or you've got three days or it could be any time now. And any of those timelines can shift. Um, 
people can still die of, you know, let's say someone is dying of an advanced cancer, they can still have a heart attack. So what you're expecting may not unfold and that can be very difficult to, to manage. So be present with whatever that looks like for you. It, it may not be that you're present at the time of death, but being present can take on a lot more than, than just that. <laughs> Expected home deaths here where I am, you need some paperwork in order, all right? The paperwork here where I am is called an expected death in the home form, short to Edith, okay? I love that, nice old fashioned name. Um, the Edith form will be filled out if you are, um, if it's anticipated that you'll die sometime in the next three months, your doctor will fill this out and you will register this with a funeral home. Doing that means that when the death occurs, you can simply call the funeral home. You don't have to call the police. And, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons that you might not want the police involved at the, at an expected home death, or frankly, even an unexpected home death. Um, they don't have really much training at all in, in this, and they have no choice but to attend. So if you are expecting a home death, whatever jurisdiction you're in, speak to your doctors, to, to your care team about what paperwork needs to be in place so that when the death does occur, things can move very smoothly. All right. Really key with an expected home death, you'll notice that there's no little sign on here that says homes have morgues because homes don't have morgues. But that said, nothing really needs to happen all that fast. All right. In an expected home death, you can wait, especially when the paperwork is in order, you can wait quite some time before you call for the transfer of that person's body. You can do that and call for that transfer by simply calling the funeral home. They will arrange that. They will put that in place. And even if you decide to call the funeral home four seconds after that last, last breath has been taken, you can say, you know what? I would like some time with my person. Please don't send anyone for at least two hours please don't send anyone until tomorrow morning. That is okay. There are natural changes that occur and they begin to occur immediately after a death. And the warmer the space that you're in, the more rapidly those changes will occur. But even, on a, even in the middle of a heat dome, like what we experienced last summer, there are ways to keep a body cool for a number of hours and to prevent any significant changes from taking place. And that liminal space after a death has occurred is some of the most beautiful and sacred space that you will ever share with your person. So do not feel rushed. Do not feel that you need to move quickly. And when the transfer team does come, I, I know a lot of transfer drivers, these guys, these folks, because there's a lot of women doing it now too, these people are really a special breed and um, most of them have been very well trained and will offer you uh, an experience to, uh, an opportunity to um, be part of the transfer, to be part of removing your person from the bed or the chair or wherever they were onto the stretcher and then out into the van. And then they'll go off to the funeral home, to the morgue in the funeral home. In an expected home death, you might get during your paperwork with them. They might say something like, oh, how, how big is your mom? Um, they might say things like, do you have stairs in your home? Where is the bedroom located? They're not just being um, nosy. They actually need to know that so they send the right number of people and the right type of equipment. It is very, very simple to remove a 92 pound lady from a spot that has no stairs and a, and a working elevator than it is to uh, remove a six foot four, 280 pound man 
from a place with a walk up uh, with no elevator. So those questions will come your way. And even in an unexpected home death situation, which I'll get to in a moment, um, you, you, will, um, you will likely be asked those questions. They can throw people. It's part of knowing what you don't know. So that's why I want to put it up, up there. So the unexpected home death is tough. And in fact, unexpected deaths in general can be a bit of a shit show. Sometimes a death occurs and no one was present. Sometimes it can actually be quite some time before someone becomes present. It can be very shocking. A, a home death, a, a death that occurs in the home that occurs very quickly and unexpectedly will also set off everything in our systems um, f f from an emergency perspective. Our reptilian brain goes into overdrive when someone that we know or love um, is, is, in a, is in a stressful situation. And a fast death, a, a fast catastrophic death, for example, well, that person is really, that their survival is imperiled. Everything, it'll be difficult to see, to hear. Um, you, you probably will be in a state of shock. Um, it is very, very difficult to manage an unexpected home death. And you need to forgive yourself for that. You will have no choice but to call the police in an unexpected home death setting. The police will inform the coroner. The coroner will probably not attend the death, but the police will, and the coroner will be present in some capacity. That might be on the phone, that might actually be coming to the home to do, to begin the investigation, um, but the coroner will be informed, even if you don't see somebody with a coroner badge showing up at this event. All right, it is unlikely that you'll be able to take your time. Um, things will happen very quickly and you'll be expected to make decisions and you, you won't know unless, unless you're one of the people listening right now, you might not have a clue as to where to even get started. Here's where you get started. You have no choice but to call the police. At some point, the police will say it's time to call the funeral home. Even though you've called a funeral home, the death may still be belonging to the coroner. If that is the case, the timeline shifts radically, and we'll go into that in a little more detail a few slides later. Um, the coroner is, um, it will take possession, figuratively, of the body, and the, the, the body will be moved to what's called a coroner's morgue, all right? Until that body is released, you, you won't be able to see the body, and you might not really know what's going on with that body. The body will be safe. I can guarantee you that. The body will be safely, securely stored in a coroner's morgue as the investigation unfolds. If there is any way for you to take time in an unexpected death, do it. It's, it might be very hard. If there is even five minutes that you can carve out, do it. And if you need to ask for it, the police, for example, um, or the ambulance person who, has, who, may, who may have attended, when a, um, ambulances don't always attend and they are unlikely, very unlikely, maybe in a small town, but for the most part, they are not the people who will be removing the body either. So ask the transfer driver, ask the police, clear a little bit of space. You may not be allowed to touch your person. You may not be allowed to um, move anything in the setting that you're in. So some of the ceremony that I talked about on the previous slide, some of the idea of being with your person, helping the transfer driver, anointing, any of that stuff, that might not happen, but you can still take a little bit of time. All right, so now we're going to go into the hospice or care home setting, okay? 
The key difference with the hospice or care home death is that there is no morgue in place in virtually any hospice or care home setting. And what that means is that you are likely to be pressured a little bit to make a decision as to what to do next. Don't be. <laughs> you might need an advocate. Um, you're probably noticing that these slides have a lot of the same words on them, and that is intentional. Even in an expected hospice or care home death, just like in a hospital setting, things might not have gone, and a home setting, sorry for that matter, things might not go as expected. You may or may not be present at the very end, and that is okay. Being present can look like a lot of different things, but it's just really important that, especially in an expected setting, that you've made it very clear with the caregivers that you want to be called in or not, right? Whatever your wishes are, you have made them clear to the caregivers so that if you want to be called in at whatever time of night, if you want your person to not be touched, not be moved, by anyone but you, make sure they know that, all right? In a hospice or care home setting, um, there is no more, and you will likely need to, you'll be given very little time to make a decision about where the, per the person is going to go, and you'll be given a shockingly small amount of time to clear out their space. Um, it, it's sometimes hours. That said, you can always ask for a minimum of three hours um, to from whenever the death occurred. Um, and keep in mind that it will likely take almost two for the transfer team to arrive, okay? So no matter what, you've got this time built in because nobody's able to just pick up and go, right? You've got a minimum of two hours, no matter what. It's quite common to ask for three. You may be able to push it a little longer, um, in the case of a, a, a big mass event happening, I know, like, for example, during the second wave of COVID here and where I am, uh, that wasn't always possible. We needed beds, beds were needed. And so there was a lot of rushing. All right. Um, so when you can, take your time, ask for what you need. All right. But do understand the practical matter is that there is no morgue there. And so your person will need to be moved to a funeral home within a matter of hours. They'll go from wherever they are to the morgue in the funeral home. And we'll talk about what happens after at that stage, a few more slides ahead. All right, so sometimes an unexpected hospice or care home death occurs. So again, that's kind of like, Things, can, things might not be as expected, even in a palliative setting, right? So an unexpected death um, could be a death that occurred from uh, accidentally. It could be a death that occurred um, even in a homicide or something like that, right? That would necessitate the involvement of the coroner, all right? The same applies. There is still no morgue here. There will be things that need to happen quickly. You may or may not, depending on the circumstances, be able to be present. And so you just, you just need to understand that. The coroner will be involved in a truly unexpected event. Um, and all you can do in these settings is ask for what you need. What you might need is time. They may or may not be able to give it to you. These are very unusual circumstances, but I just want to um, I just want to throw it out there. Even in a setting like this, which is going to um, kind of rival the type of uh, experience that you might have in an unexpected home death, can be very confusing, um, sort of a sense of pandemonium and whatnot. You can ask for time at the minimum. All right, it's my unicorn. An expected community death doesn't really happen. I can't really think of, a, of an experience where we would expect a death to occur sort of outside of a home, hospital, hospice setting, um, uh, hospital setting, care home. There is, it is unlikely <laughs> um, 
that we would ever have an expected death outside of one of those spaces. So I don't really know what to say about them. I'm not sure they exist. Oops, sorry. But an unexpected community death is very difficult to deal with. So this, by this I mean a death that occurs for someone not in their own home, perhaps out on the street, perhaps in the Safeway parking lot, um, perhaps in a friend's home or something like that. Um, but these unexpected community deaths are almost always going to necessitate the involvement of a coroner. They can often be an emergency situation and you will likely have a complete and total lack of control over timelines. Practically speaking, if a death occurs, let's say, um, let's say someone loses their, gets, gets the information that their person has been found at a friend's home and they're not responsive, they're dead, and it's Friday at 4.40. That death of a long weekend, Friday of a long weekend, that death will absolutely become a coroner-involved death. And the coroner's office works weekends, the coroner themselves and the coroner's team works weekends, but the coroner's office is not open and will not be open again until Tuesday morning, all right? If it's a long weekend, you will have no information. You won't know, you may not even know where your person has been taken. You will not be able to see them. It is nothing like TV. You will not go to a, um, a police officer's, you know, building and then go down the stairs and have a, a slide pulled out and look down at your, no, that none of that happens. Your person will be in a locked coroner's morgue over the weekend. You may or may not even know where that person is. You won't have access to them. This is where a good funeral director can actually really help. Um, a good funeral director or a good funeral provider in the community, um, one that's been around for a while or that just has a real depth of relationships, they might, be, they might know people who they can call and ask, and sometimes they can even just track down, for example, with the police, with the incident number, and sometimes with the coroner's number, uh, the coroner case number, they may be able to get through to someone even though the office is closed. So ask your funeral director how they can help. If you need, if you have a sense where you need to know what is going to happen or what already has happened, ask your funeral director. And if you don't get an answer from that funeral director, ask another one. And if you don't like, remember too, that your person is not at a funeral home at this point. So if you are not liking what you're getting, the service that you're getting from your funeral director, the person has not been taken into the care of the funeral home. The person has only been taken into the care of the coroner. Even if the coroner is renting morgue space from a specific funeral home, that person does not have to stay at that funeral home. You can go find whatever funeral home and whatever funeral provider and whatever funeral director you need to find. And there will be no charges for, for that kind of you know, transfer or whatnot. So a good funeral director is, is like, it can just be so helpful in these absolutely horrifying situations. Unexpected deaths are two a one, some of the most difficult to manage. All right, so those are the basic kinds of, of deaths that we've that we've gone through, the kinds of reasonable expectations. And I would like to just take a little bit of time to help you understand what you're going to do. Now you've taken some time wherever you are and the person's gone now. The person has been rolled away either to the hospital morgue or they've gone in the van right off to the morgue in the funeral home or they're at the coroner's morgue, okay? So what you're going to be asked to do is have what's called an arrangement meeting. And an arrangement meeting is, is the meeting where 
All of the decisions about the disposition, which is in Canada, only two legal options, cremation or burial, okay, um, you're going to be asked all of the questions about what those decisions are, okay? And who is going to be asked is the person who controls disposition. That list is defined very clearly and it is legislatively controlled. The person will always be the executor if there was a will in place and then it goes under a very specific list. So living spouse and then adult children and then it goes all the way down a very very distinct list until we get right down to a ministry. Um, like for so if a person has literally no people they will still have someone to control their disposition. The thing is, is unless you have a will with a clearly stated executor, this list is absolutely ironclad and you can't skip over, all right? So if you have a um, very elderly father, let's say, who's died, no will in place, his spouse, his wife, perhaps your mother, is the person who will be in charge of controlling the disposition. That might be exactly the wrong person to be in charge because she might be totally devastated. So understand that funeral directors have no choice but to deal with the person who controls the disposition and that can be very very difficult. So short version, too long didn't read, make sure you have a will. The paperwork for these arrangements can be incredibly daunting. All right. Um, <laughs> I see people get stuck all the time. One of the questions that uh, Vital Statistics asks when a registration of a death is, is going on is what is the person who died? What is their mother's and father's birth names? You, you know what? If you didn't know that you were going to be asked that, you can actually get really spirally on, on that. And they're like, what is the spelling? And God, she came over from Poland. And I can't remember if that was ever, oh, I have to go. And you know what? People will be like off in the woods with focusing on this stupid question about what is the, what are the parents' names, birth names of the person who died instead of focusing on what really matters. So in this arrangement meeting, you will likely be dealing with a funeral director who has two jobs. One is to make sure the disposition cremation or burial occurs as you wish and the other frankly is likely especially if you're dealing with a large corporate chain will be to sell you things all right so be clear have as much information as you can in advance and what I really want to drill home here is that all of this is stuff that you can prepare for and you can do in advance I'm not talking about prepaying for a funeral that is a great option like my mother <laughs> paid for hers in 1995 she paid 1600 dollars for something that when we enact it whenever she dies in the next little while uh will likely be a twenty thousand dollar funeral so you know prices go up right and you can lock that in that's a very practical matter i am not advocating that but what i am advocating is that you know what will be asked and that you put this work into place in advance. You know what the what your parents' maiden names were, birth names were, um, and you know what your people want. <coughs> because when that arrangement meeting is occurring, your funeral director is going to ask you things like, "Would you like us to take fingerprints? Would you like to do a DNA kit?" Um, they're going to ask, "Would you like flowers? Should we put a memorial card together? Would you like an obituary?" Um, is there anything on their body that, you know, a, a skilled embalmer could remove so that you could and preserve? Like, there are questions. There are many, many questions that will be asked of you. Excuse me. And if you are guessing, you're going to feel totally overwhelmed. So a good end of life doula can help you prepare for this. A good death educator. <clears throat> I happen to know one can help you prepare for this. So think about that, okay? Now, remember I told you how pathologically practical I am. This is what we're here for, right? At some point, you are going to have to make decisions about how to deal with the body. 
And in Canada, we only have three legal options, burial, flame-based cremation, and alkaline hydrolysis. We, um, we don't have composting, we don't like natural organic um, uh, reduction, which is available in, in a couple of states. Um, mushroom suits are a hoax. Um, even though we are surrounded by three beautiful oceans, we, burials at sea are virtually impossible in Canada. Um, permission or freeze drying doesn't exist. And if you think you're going to get your body donated to science, think again. It is an iffy option at best, and it is one that you need to plan for, even if your body is accepted at the time of the application it may not be accepted at the time of death for about 372,000 reasons. So donating your body to science, very, very iffy option. Three legal options, burial, flame-based cremation, and alkaline hydrolysis, also known as aquamation. Sadly, that's not legal here in British Columbia, but just watch me, we're, we're really about to change that. Um, here's the thing, <laughs> don't say, just put me in a dumpster. We can't do that. There are three legal options. Putting you in a dumpster is not one of them. So you are going to have to think ahead. You don't have to, but if you don't, you are putting the people who will need to deal with you when you're dead in a really uncomfortable position because they'll be guessing what you want and um, it will impede the processes of, of grieving and of mourning. So think about it, document your wishes, and talk about it with people. You can even pre-purchase it if you want to. That's not the important piece. The important piece is documenting your wishes and thinking ahead. So, after you've met with the funeral director and you've made those 172 million decisions that you need to make about the actual um, disposition, which could be as simple as, I would like a direct cremation. I would like you to take my mother's body, place her in a, put her in a bag, put her in a box, which is legally required in British Columbia. No viewing, no visitation, no services of any kind, straight to the crematorium, about a week later, I would like you to mail me back my mother's cremated remains, and then I will just put them in a shoebox in the closet. All right. But do you see how many decisions there were actually even in that very, very simple, what we think of as a simple disposition? We actually had to decide whether we will have a viewing or not. We will have to decide um, what, you know, will, will the body go in just the basic box or will it go in a more... Uh, a fancier box? Will it go in a box that dad made for her? And then afterwards, when the remains are finished, is that going to go in a cardboard box that the funeral home will just supply for free? Or is there a mason jar kicking around that you want, or, or an urn of some sort that you want to put her in? Even the simplest still has a little tree beneath it of decisions. And then you've got an estate to deal with. So <laughs> even um, even a child has an estate. They have things that need to be dealt with afterwards. But someone who dies in their midlife or, or in their early senior years, for example, they might have an absolute nest of things to deal with. And spouses or, or their partners or people in their lives may not even know where to begin unpacking what is going on in that estate. So it is really important to do some work around your, um, your legalities and your finances and things like that so that you have those quote, affairs in order. Passwords need to be known and stored. Assets, lists of assets are incredibly helpful for the people who are dealing with the realities of what has taken place when you're dead. But before we get completely bogged into those snarly realities, I'd also like you to consider the legacy piece, the non-financial legacy piece 
the most important part of the legacy, which is the heart will or the or the love that is left behind, the essence that is left behind. The legacy, it's not about the big donation to a university or that kind of thing. The lessons that you want to leave, the words, the imaginings that you need to leave behind, these are all things that you can think about and prepare for well in advance of leaving this mortal coil. And it can be so beautiful and so uh, connecting and centering to do this because one thing is, is that you will not leave a snarl behind. You will not leave more work and devastation behind if you do this in advance. And if you um, take time to think about what matters in the end, you're going to be able to truly understand what matters right now. And it's actually not that hard. It's not that scary. So I am the firm believer that absolutely everybody needs a funeral director friend. <laughs> There's not that many of us, right? Uh, but I am willing to, to be yours. So you can reach me at hello at deathsapprentice.ca. You, um, you can find me on Instagram at deathsapprentice.ca. And I would be so happy to, I'm just going to stop the share. Um, I would be so happy to do, uh, to, to be your friend, as it were. Um, and I would really like to also let you know that some remember what I said at the beginning with the your mileage may vary. There's one key piece, and if anyone was was taking notes <laughs> or or sort of jotting things down, um, when a death occurs in any of the settings that I had laid out for you, there will be some paperwork that it gets taken care of behind the scenes by your funeral director. The first one is a medical certificate of death. The second one is a disposition permit. The third one is a transportation permit. And the fourth one is a death certificate. A lot of these things kind of sound a little bit alike. That death certificate is what you will need to do to manage that snarl that I was, that I was talking to you about before. Um, and that death certificate will only come when those other things are dealt with. So even if you use a funeral director for nothing else except that paperwork, which truly is an option, uh, funeral directors will know in your jurisdiction, exactly how to manage those pieces. It usually starts with a medical certificate and then goes through to those others that I told you about. So that's the kind of practical detail that a, that a funeral director like me can, can impart. And um, I hope that you are happy and fulfilled and delighted and ready to ask questions or just want to go have tea. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Krista. That was amazing. That was fantastic. And because I'm a funeral director as well, and it's just yeah. so sometimes you think that things are going to be different. It's just universal, really. <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, all of the things that you said just do relate to here as well in the UK. Erin said that um, this was at the beginning when you were talking yes. about some. Um, can you say that I've personally experienced both an unexpected and sorry, and both an expected and unexpected home death, and they're very different experiences. So yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. And 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 I think that it's so important to understand that um, even in the expected situation, sometimes the unexpected can unfold. Um, it's a little bit like birth, you know, the labor, the labor of birth. We can go and I'm, I'm well past this age, but, but I, I remember mine and we can have our birth plans in place and we can have everything all written out right down to the T and what, what music we're going to have playing and that sort of thing. And then you can end up with an emergency C-section, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of the same at the end too. And just being for, forewarned, like I, I, I have this, uh, hope, uh, this dream of, of writing a book as big as what to expect when you're expecting, but calling it what to expect when you're expecting to die. 
<laughs> or not expecting to die. <laughs> <laughs> or not expecting to die. Um, but you know, I don't think I don't think it would fly off the shelves, right? Yeah. <laughs> <We don't know. laughs> I never know. Oh, just... I've never seen Peace Hold. Thank you, Leslie. I'm going to make a note of that. I personally use legalwills.ca. Um, I I love them. Um, Legal Wills oh. were here. Talk. Sorry, I was going to say they were yeah. talking last night. Do you know night. why? Because I told them to. to oh, be in touch with thank you. you. He was amazing, <laughs> and um, and because he's originally from England and now he's over in Canada, but yeah. it was all, again, it just relates because they've got they have got um branches here as well in the UK but yeah no I mean the the paperwork is can be overwhelming when you first even as a female director when you're first um learning about it because it's yeah there's lots of um I mean it's sort of like it, it is a minefield isn't it because if especially when the coroner is involved because then certain piece of isn't needed to pay for work but another piece is and very oh yeah options are are also like because cremations I suppose you have to have there's a bit more paperwork because if there's any there's nothing to um someone can be buried and then is exhumed can't they well, it's a, you know what when I'm doing the paperwork with families I'll like you know you bring out this like stack like this I'll be like look I'm sorry dudes but um you can unbury, but you cannot uncremate. Exactly. And yes. So, so this is going to take a while, right? And but just imagine, like that's your well, you 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 yeah. are like me. You're a funeral director. You don't yeah, yeah. have to imagine it. You see it all the time. Yeah. Where you are sitting with somebody who has not given any thought to any of it, and yeah. Yeah, I feel terrible when that's happening because I'm like, how can I reasonably ask this 72 year old woman who has just lost her husband of 54 years mm -hmm. to let me know if she even wants a casket spray, much <laughs> less, much less any of the other 37,000 yeah, questions yeah. that I'm, that I'm asking her. It's and you, and you have to, and you have to ask yeah. some questions because like, especially with, I mean, you don't have to, but I think it's important that you should ask questions about what someone wants you to do with the body as in, I mean, you have to be gentle, but as to whether they want you to sort of wash. Some people might not want you to touch the body at, really right. at all. And That's so, right. but it's, it's those sort of questions that suddenly you're having to ask someone and you have Who to- Who is in this state, yeah. you know, and you have to, uh, you know, two, two points on that. I recently um, took a, a death from a, a coroner death mm. from a woman who, and this happens really frequently over here. It's a bit shady practice kind of situation. I'm not sure if it happens there coroners here don't have our their own coroner morgues um they lease space in a funeral home and so yeah so what yes, happens is the coroner the body goes to the coroner morgue that is right. in the funeral home and then okay. people assume that the body belongs to the funeral home already but uh, okay but it doesn't no. And it could actually go to any funeral home yeah. at that point. So I sort of rescued a, a, a coroner death situation not too long ago from, from that. And this woman who had lost her child, she had mm -hmm. lost her 18-year-old son one day after his 18th birthday. Uh, to, we, we're having a drug poisoning crisis here. Mm -hmm. um, the, the funeral director there, who was just assuming that they were going to use their mm -hmm. services, didn't ask at all about viewing about whether a lock of hair was wanted mm -hmm. whether there wanted to be any involvement in the washing or dressing or casketing or whatever and and they would have they would have literally gone to a direct cremation if yeah. they there was a friend who had actually been in a class yeah. that i had been a guest lecturer in and this friend just reached out and was like mm -hmm. krista I, can you please talk to this this family and so i was like okay we can do this we can do that we can do this other thing would you like to try this whatever it ended up being a completely different experience mm -hmm. and i also made a, like a lifelong friend out of that that beautiful mother and you know what I, but yes were all those questions hard to ask yes yes they but were but did it turn her experience from one that was just the very, very worst to just a tiny exactly. bit less worst? Yeah. You know? So there, are, there are some shady, I mean, they're trying to stop practices like that over here, but, you know, sort of like say care, I don't know, like sometimes care home that I think you touched on the fact that if someone's in a care home, did you say that in your, um, you need to make sure that you've got in place where that's, who the funeral director is or what yeah, happened because they, otherwise it, they do just they 
they say oh, we can't keep them here and then you, that's in right. the middle of the night you have to suddenly decide Oof. where you want them to go off, or, off you're going yes so it's a best practice now it's not a it's a practice not a um uh, yeah. you know not a rule not yet a, but yeah yeah, and I, so, the, the amazing Cheryl has said, you talked yeah. about Edith, what changes if there is also a planned home funeral? That's a great question, but don't you want to wait until next year for me to answer it, Cheryl? No, okay, I will tell you. Um, so um, remember, slide, <laughs> remember slide one or two where I said that I'm not the expert? There is, in our town, there is an incredible funeral um, home that really specializes in uh, assisting families with the with the home elements, right? Uh, and that's called Koru Cremations. They were here too, presenting. So what changes is that you need to have the expected death of the uh, in, in the home form completed. You need to do all of the registration for the disposition permit yourself. That is called a registration of death. You take the medical certificate that will be given to you by the um, by the signing doctor of your Edith form. You go through the vital statistics agency and you, you do what's called registering the death. Once the death is registered, you can request a disposition permit. The permit, um, uh, and you don't need any funeral director for this. You can do all of this yourself, okay? Um, or you can work with a funeral director who specializes in this kind of thing. And yes, there will be some fees associated with that, but it will take a lot of the grunty stuff off of your, off of your, um, your plate. After you've registered the death, you'll be able to print what's called a disposition permit. With the disposition permit, you will need to, once you have that, you will need to arrange for the transportation permit because remember, we can't just throw you in a dumpster, right? So you will go from that beautiful home, home ceremony that you've created at some point, maybe a day, maybe three days later, in BC, it will certainly be a minimum of 48 hours because we cannot cremate less than 48 hours after a death has occurred, but we can bury. We can bury within as quickly as the paperwork is managed, so often well within 12 hours, like especially in the case of Jewish deaths or things like that. Um, so once you've got the disposition permit, you're going to need to get a transport permit. You're going to need to have the special kind, oh, hi, Carla. You're gonna to need to have a special kind of vehicle to transport your dead person. That's another thing that the funeral home can assist with if you decide to use like a hybrid model. Um, the funeral home will have that kind of vehicle. Um, it, it's got a bunch of rules. It doesn't have to be a hearse, but it has to be a certain kind of vehicle here uh, that has like blackened windows and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you will transport the body either to the, directly to the burial site or to the crem crematorium. Um, and you'll need you'll need those permits in place. You'll also the burial site is frankly probably going to be easier to to navigate than the crem cremation. Mm -hmm. um, there are very very few very few crematoria in where I live, um, and uh, another reason that we need alkaline hydrolysis so badly. Um, but many of them are tied to the the few that we have are very closely tied to the really big players like SCI and Arbor and they will not accommodate external cremations so you're going to be going Cheryl either over to Vancouver Island or well into the valley and you're going to go to a cremation a, crem a cremationist there so again those are the things that like if you have not made this arrangement in advance this will be too much for you to deal with at the time and a good death educator or doula can help with all of these things thank you that's exactly right and then carla said curious if you know of any resources that explains what family members should expect to see experience during the dying process uh to die at home carla that's a great question and i can connect you with some of that why don't you um hmm can't remember if you took Tracy's class or not at Douglas College, but why don't you why don't you write me at hello at deathsapprentice.ca? I know we're already connected actually. Um, so why don't you write me, ask for that? I think I have some um, not super like bite-sized chunks though, just so you know. So that might be, that might have to be a chapter in our book, what to expect when you're expecting to. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so how, how long have you been a funeral director, Krista? Did you start? Uh, I'm 51 now, almost 52, and I started this when I was 48. 
Okay, because so, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm 50 and I started, I've only been doing it a year, but it's the best job I've ever done. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I finally know what I want to be when I grow up, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing. And I think being a being a woman with a of a certain age, you know, with a bit of gray hair and whatnot, yeah. like I, I took to it. Um, there was so much that that was so closely related to my previous careers in hospitality mm. and then in education. Okay um that i just i feel like a like a duck in the pond yeah. like i just i just feel like i get it you know yeah my, i mean mine not to talk about me my um my last job i was an agent for hair and makeup artists in the fashion industry i wasn't doing the hair and makeup but actually it was trying it was really translatable because it's dealing with lots of different moving parts yes like sheets going and things like that so yeah even though it seems miles away from it it's actually yeah. quite similar <laughs> Oh, I love that Teresa has said that she's just starting out as her end of life deal. Teresa, oh. where are you located? I'm so proud of you, by the way. Yay. New Zealand. Oh, Teresa, do you know Willow EOL? Let me type it in. I think we've got two educators there. Um, uh, yeah, Teresa, if you're up for it, find me on Instagram and, and send me a note or, or, or drop me a line. Um, there's some really there's a really beautiful like global organization that's doing some spectacular work that you might you might find a great like little to add to your toolkit okay what you know what i just i cannot get over what you have created here this weekend like you folks just gave her like like bring it sister is all i have to say <laughs> it just developed it i mean I think I'll have to pinch myself and it'll hit me later, I think. But it's just, yeah. don't, don't worry. It, it's three o'clock in the morning. You're no, talking. it's no, it's seven o'clock at night. Oh, is it? Okay. I didn't think it hit me in that way. What I meant is it'll hit me. The, the enormity of it is the, the thing that will, because it's just amazing. But it's it was just, we started, as you say, there's so many people within this sort of, I hate to call it industry, but with this, you know, not industry, within the whole, community Profession. community yes. yeah. yeah and so it just it just grew and grew and grew and it was just the fact that we were doing it the fact that we had to do it online actually made it amazing because it meant that we did it internationally because we probably wouldn't have done that okay otherwise. well i know the the best hybrid events person in the world a woman named christina from new narratives so next year yes. let's do it live and then yep. um and then we'll get christina to hook us up to the hybrid portion fantastic and, yeah because that's yeah. what we wanted to, that's what we really want to do we want to do lots of still have it online to bring everyone together yeah. but have it lots of live events all over the world <laughs> okay all over the world and an actual conference in the uk yeah yes yeah, so well yeah i mean we'll have let's to do it We'll talk. Let's yeah. do it. We'll figure it out. Don't worry. I got Christina. We just need a, you and we have a bigger energy. team than just me and Joe at the beginning. <laughs> no, no, no. Now you have now you have Krista on it. So there you go. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> hey, so, um, Aaron. Oh, Aaron is fifty yeah. and trying to find an EOL doula program. Aaron, where are you, love? Oh, Ontario. Um, okay, so Douglas College. Um, I can I can hook you up there. They do an online program. Uh, a spectacular, uh, short investment. Um, it's, I think it's five days and not that much money. Um, I, I'm one of the guest lecturers, uh, but the, um, it, it's one of the positives of COVID was, was that their program that used to just be delivered here is delivered now around the world. It's definitely a starting point, Erin. And what's really important to understand is that there is no certification in Canada at the moment. It's actually part of why I became a funeral director because that is one of the only legal uh, certifications that uh, that exists in the end of life space. Bye, honey. Um, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, you're not going to be a certified doula when you when you walk out of that course a week later. Um, there's a there's quite a journey ahead of you, but it's an amazing starting point, and it can connect you to all sorts of people. Sophie took it. Um, there was there were there were folks in my class when I first took it, and now I'm, I continue to meet people when I when I now speak as a guest lecturer in it um, that can help you as uh, as Victoria said, like build into that uh, community, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very it's very um, 
it's a great starting spot and I can help connect you guys. So again, send me a note and follow me on Instagram, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> oh yeah. And Cheryl, that's right. It's uh, it's yeah. I took it Monday to Friday um, and it was really intense. And then the other way is like, sometimes it's on evenings and weekends. And then there's one other option where it's like just weekends for four weeks or something like that. So I think however you take it, it ends up being super intense and like bringing stuff together for you. But for me, I was just like, let's get this done because I'm like that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, exactly, Cheryl. That's, you know what? And I think the reason that I loved not being able to absorb was because I just felt like I was in a washing machine the whole time. or like seaweed, you know? Um, and yeah, I think it was, I think it was exactly what I needed, but reflecting would have been quite, and integrating would have been pretty amazing too. I suppose it's good for different people and to different ways that they different absorb ways. it as well. Yeah, it ways. Oh, hey folks, can I, um, as shameless self, um, self aggrandizing, is that, is that allowed? Okay. Oh, gosh, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, good. It's I, um, let me. I, I'm just gonna find this. That's, okay. Um, so I uh, don't know where everybody is from. Actually, what, what, I've got somebody from New Zealand, um, and we've got Sophie, who I think right now is back in BC, but I'm not sure. Cheryl's in BC. We know we've got somebody from Ontario here, but anyway, oh, we've got 15. Well, there's. Um, not included, 15 eyes, including well, us. No, not, not in, yeah, including us is 15. So it's 13 people in so there. Yeah. 13 eyes that I wouldn't have otherwise been here on a Sunday morning. No, That's so right. exciting. <laughs> that that link it goes to my website to the about sort of the about me page, and at the bottom of that page, I've got the first three of my uh, radio spots that have been on in the last uh, three months: September, October, November. Um, we're running this, I was really lucky, actually in the doula course, I met a nationally known radio personality and we hit it off and I pitched her and she picked it up. So I have a program, not a program, I have a, a, a segment on mm-hmm. her program, which broadcasts live to British Columbia, uh, which is a pretty big province over here. Um, and it's exactly my listenership, like just a bunch of old middle-aged white ladies like me, right? Like I tell you, we, and we are all into talking about this stuff, right? So these are potters and pickle makers and just like sweet, (laughs) sweet people. CBC kind of equivalent to BBC over there, actually absolutely equivalent to to BBC. So it's a program that runs, um, uh, in BC on the weekends and it broadcasts to all of BC and I'm on it once a month talking about death so these poor guys who don't know like they're just tuning in with their tea or whatever and then they're like (laughs) they've got me right all up in their face um i could use this um i i need this to to ripple outwards and so if if all 13 of you would (laughs) please go to that link and then listen um and if you have anyone that you could share the pieces with um, I am really definitely looking for more media. The next space that we're going to, the next t- topic that I'm going to be tackling with Cheryl is actually about green options in disposition. Here in BC, we're terribly limited. We only have green burial. There is no alkaline hydrolysis. There's no natural organic reduction. And this is a, this is a legislative issue. We are going to have to change this at such a high level. And it is so necessary. We've just had some of the most devastating climate change events ever in our province and remember i mentioned those goddamn boomers that are getting set to die oh sorry i love you guys i really do i seriously do (laughs) but um but they they are about to die right they are getting set to die and and the the environmental impact of death is huge and we need to get on this so the next Mm -hmm. segment is actually on um, these these options that are not yet legal in bc and i'm really hoping for kind of groundswell um, to, I think it'll be a well-received uh, piece, and honestly, if it can be received in other parts of Canada, mm-hmm. other parts of the world, I would be so appreciative. So please, please. please. Oh, no, definitely, we will. <laughs> but well, I mean, here we haven't got water because we haven't got water cremation here, right? We haven't got. You don't? No, and um, but as someone said, so speaking to was it way at the beginning, the the death wives who were on, um, mm-hmm. they were saying. 
don't know if it was them that's someone said that they make the equipment here but it's not le that some of the equipment is made here but we can't it's a yeah me and jen need to get on that <laughs> so it's a legislative issue right and and i mean yeah. here it, we have one spectacular forward-thinking province here in canada saskatchewan of all things who knew um, and they literally just made what, a single word change in the reg, in the regulations rather than opening the act and it legalized it. Okay. That's how they did it. And it was a single word. Okay. So like, ugh, you know, but BC is stonewalling and is saying right. that we need to do all of this work that's already been done. The science doesn't yeah. change. The work has already been done. The proof is is absolutely categorical. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? Politicians won't stand on on this. Nobody, there's not a politician. Well, they're just not interested. Anywhere. They're not <laughs> interested. They don't want to talk about death on their stump speech, right? That is kind of the kiss of death right there. So. But then they've been, had. that's why they've all been, because of COVID, they've all been forced to talk about it. So. And look at this, Cheryl, saying that they're all funded by Big Funeral. Yeah, you're yeah, probably yeah. right. SCI has probably bought them. I'm sorry yeah, no. if there's any SCI people here, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we have, we have companies over here, so yeah, that uh, the chains that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. quite, um, yeah. I, it's, I mean, there's it's, it's good people that work there, but then it's just, I don't know, sometimes it's, it's a lot about the money. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Here, almost everybody gets started with them because they're the ones who can afford the apprentices. Um, yeah. But uh, I've, they're doing I've anything. actually been lucky because I've, well, I've worked at first for, for six months. I worked for a small sort of an independent, but that was more like a freelance basis. And then the, where I am is an independent. But it's, um, yeah, I mean, there's, if you, you're not going to make money in the fu funeral <laughs> trade. As, like my previous job was, more money but i wasn't as happy <laughs> yeah happy this one. well you know on my on my about the apprentice page i, I joke that I, I went from corner office to cubicle which is not the, the way you're supposed <laughs> to do it at all um yeah you don't get into this for the predictable hours no. and the big money but it sure is it yeah, sure it's is rewarding. great right you yeah, get in, yeah you get into it for this community for those 13 people that are listening exactly. or 12 exactly. people now <laughs> that are listening to us and, well, and it's just yeah and and for these like these connections these global connections so, yeah yeah no, it's brilliant it's like i feel like we found a big family thank you my darling you. i think we should we should let people yeah. go everybody who came today thank you and um and i'm here with whatever whatever you need and oh. i just re oh. Trace, I can't wait to be your friend. I didn't have I don't have a friend in New Zealand, so now I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You should send you do now. Yeah. Oh <laughs> you're adorable too. All right, my darlings. Have a great day. Oh, take care anyway. Oh, we'll, and we'll be talking lots more. Yeah. Yeah. We will. hundred yeah. percent. All right. We'll take care. Okay. Bye. Bye.